For the last seven months, I have been part of a mentorship program and community for seven and eight figure entrepreneurs. That's right, I've got mentors as well. It costs $30,000 to get in. Um, it's pretty sweet. The name of the community is called Partners. It's part of the college ecosystem. It's run by my good friend, Blake LaGrange. And what I wanna share today is a video that I made actually for that community documenting the last seven months in my business. I made a ton of massive, massive shifts in this time period, which led to me being more kind of aligned than I've ever felt with my business, making more money than I've ever made in my business, shutting down my agency, which is making a ton of money and a whole lot more. So this basically just documents the entire seventh month journey. And it's all really like set around this onboarding that I did. So part of the program is, um, at the very beginning, you do a intense marathon onboarding session. It's like four or five hours. Um, you could do it in person or on Zoom. I did it on Zoom. And at the end of this like intense, intense onboarding, I was left with four action items that I had to reckon with in order to kind of get into the next phase of my business. So the following seven months after that were me basically taking action on that, coming to terms with it and how I implemented all of it. So if you wanna hear what it looks like to spend 30 grand on a mentorship program, what those action items looked like in my business, how I implemented them, what the outcomes were, it's all in here. So there's a lot of really good stuff in here, how I shut down the agency, how I picked up a new fuel and started sharing a lot more about what's going on in my personal life, um, how I launched a brand new offer in under 30 days that made a bunch of money. It's got something for everyone in here. Um, so if you're listening to this on the podcast feed, there is a video component. Um, so you can go over to YouTube if you want to see the video side of things or just listen to the audio. Otherwise, I'm going to jump over to the Loom video. Last piece of context is this video was recorded for the community. So if I end up using any kind of like weird language or jargon, you'll just have to excuse me. It was not originally built for public consumption, but I was like, this thing is great. People need to see this. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. This is going to be uh, a good one. And uh, so yeah, strap in. All right. What's up, everyone? This video is called seven months in college. Uh, let me move myself over here. All right. So this video is meant to summarize my first seven months of mentorship in partners. It also exists to mark the milestone of the completion of the four main action items that I had on my onboarding call, which I did on October 31st. So it took me about seven months to do all this. Uh, one, it was extremely helpful for me to sit down and just reflect on you know the entirety of the journey so far. And I hope that it will also be useful um, for people that are coming up behind me to see how it worked for me Take what you want from it, leave the rest. Um, but I hope that there are some things in here that will be useful. All right, a little timeline if you're curious as to the cadence of what's been going on up until this point. Today's June 3rd, 2024, which is a Monday. It's about 8 p.m. Um, I did my onboarding call on October 31st, so about seven months ago. Um, then I launched a new program on November 28th, 2023, uh, maybe about a month later. Um, I closed down my agency officially on March 1st, 2024. And there's something called New Fuel, which I'll tell you what that is in a second, um, on May 24th, 2024. In that time period, business-wise, uh, things have been great. I did $454,000 in revenue and accounts receivable over those seven months. And that includes nothing from my agency. Okay. This is all just from my, I guess, info business and, and the, my kind of mentorship program that I'm doing. All right, let's get into it about me. Probably some of you are going to watch this video and have no idea who I am, which is cool. Um, but this context might be a little bit helpful. The short <laughs> bio is I ran a design agency for 10 years. Uh, that's how I spent, I guess, the first period of my career. Did about $500,000 in 2022. And I guess what was interesting about it was I only worked around 10 hours a week running it. In 2022, I also started my quote unquote info business, uh, which initially began just as a business to share kind of the insights that I had been gathering working on this agency and really kind of transforming it into a lifestyle business. And I really just started posting on IG in 2021. Um, 
you can find me here if you want to see what that looked like back in the day. Um, over the course of a couple of years, things went really well on social media. I grew to over 400,000 followers across Instagram, Twitter, email, threads, all that weird stuff, right? Um, yeah, my business was extremely heavily content focused. Um, that included posting daily on Instagram, weekly newsletter, a weekly podcast, all this stuff. Um, and the way that I ended up monetizing this audience was through a cohort based course. It was called how to work less it's still called how to work less. And essentially what it does is teach people how to design a lifestyle business. So I took all the learnings, all the lessons that I had from running my agency for the 10 years and figuring out how to make it make a nice amount of money and systematize it. So I was not super involved in the day to day. I only had to work about 10 hours a week running it. And uh, yeah, I just taught my method, basically all my processes, how I thought through it, how I structured it, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, at a <laughs> very modest price point of $2,000 for people to join. And it was taught live by me in a cohort model. We did about three launches a year in its peak. And in those three launches, they would each do about a hundred grand. So it made $310,000 in 2023, which leads me to coming across Blake and um, us eventually working together. So going into this, the main problem that I thought I had in my business was I wanted to figure out how to grow my course <laughs> larger, right? So I wanted to figure out, oh, how do I increase conversion rate on my sales page, right? How do I sell more people to join? How do I run ads to bring more traffic in, right? It was all focused on just like, I built this machine and how can I bring more people people into the machine um, because it was all really dialed in and there was like honestly a ton of headroom to keep doing that. All right. So that is the context. That was me on, I guess, October 31st, 2023. Um, the design agency owner, um, cohort based course person, and I guess Instagram large account haver. <laughs> yeah. All right. So where things started was this marathon onboarding session that I did with Blake. That was on October 31st, which I guess is Halloween. Um, it was a five hour session. And I want to really just share what happened in there, what Blake's takeaways were. And then really the next seven months were me processing all of this and implementing it at the same time. So I'm going to leave you with just Blake's notes first. And then we'll work backwards from there and I'll show you how these translated into my business, what I took from them, and yeah, what things look like now. So this is October 31st, 2023, marathon onboarding session, five hours long. Um, you know, had my had my whole <laughs> my whole soul read to me. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really, really powerful. I, you know, I basically just dumped everything that's been going on personally in my business what I wanted to achieve, what my big goals were, all this stuff. And then, you know, Blake came out with, <laughs> I guess, his notepad. And he was like, okay, so there are four things that you need to hear. And what he shared with me, he was like, you need to accept these four things in order to go into the next phase of your business. So these are the four things that needed to happen. I didn't make these up. This is a picture of Blake's notepad. Um, but let me go through all four of them and we can kind of talk about what they mean and what they look like. All right. And then they all turn into practical things that I either needed to learn, do, become, etc. Okay. So the first two are really interesting. The first one was for the last 12 years, fear has been your fuel. It is time to drop that fuel and pick up a new fuel. And I'm not going to speak too much about what that means yet, because I'm going to go deep into it in a second. And I think it'll be better if I just share Blake's notes. And then I'll, t I'll talk to you about what, what this fear has been fuel meant to me and what picking up a new fuel has actually looked like. Um, yeah. So Blake said that my bucket is only big enough for the life and business that I designed. So it really is kind of having diminishing returns on building this business based on fear. And at this point, I had reached a bit of a cap relying on that fear. I had run the agency, made half a million dollars, um, doing about 10 hours of work a week. And my education business was rapidly turning into inadvertently the exact same 
business on paper. So about 10 hours a week and half a million dollars a year. And that was the sign, that was the, the symptom of something that was much greater that was going on, which I'll get to in a second. Okay. Second thing that Blake said is your agency and your life is your down payment for your education business. And this is your new fuel. Okay. So he said, it's time to let go of, I've done this. So can you, you need to get clear on what the core of your value is, which is how much you can charge for an interaction with you. And I'll talk a lot about what that means. Um, and he said one thing very, very specifically, he said, it's a direct quote, if you decide to open up about this, you can make a ton of money. And it's so, so, so much more than that. Um, but that's, that's the quote. And I'll, I'll tell you what that is in a second. Um, but the lesson here that I took away is that everything that I had built up until this point was the result of a fuel that was rooted in fear. And this type of fuel is, it's like, it's like a Hummer, like just pumping out black smog, basically. Um, it can only get you so far, but there's a cap to it. And to run your business this way, just like rooted in fear, um, yeah, it becomes very difficult at a certain point to, to grow any further. Um, but when you get a new fuel, Blake's words, uh, you're going to be able to be extremely curious about what kind of business that you can build. And when you start looking at things this way, everything will change. Okay. The way that you market, the way that you create content, the way that you fulfill, there's going to be a ton of leverage and a ton of ease, and it's going to be completely, completely different. All right. And if this is all sounding very vague, it's all going to make sense in a second. Um, yeah. And he noted that there's this, this big chasm between who I am as a person, like who I actually am at the core and who I'm becoming and this fixed fulfillment nature of my cohort course, where it's essentially the same eight lessons taught over and over again by me in a prof professorial manner, um, where I'm continuing to grow basically, and, you know, keep working on my business and keep working on myself. And the, the course has just stayed the same. So I was just like blasting off in one direction. And then I would come back to the course and the same, the same lessons and the same lessons over and over again. Um, so there'll be more about that in a second. All right. The next thing, which was quite obvious was it was time to shut down my agency, the agency I'd been running for 10 years. Um, you know, my first business basically. And he said, do you shut down your agency? Like today, don't brag that it takes you five to 10 hours a week. That is valuable headspace. And the thought process behind all of this is that if I've been running these businesses based on fear, okay. And we're letting go of that. The next logical conclusion is that this agency doesn't exist. So get rid of it all. All right. And then the last thing that I needed to accept, lean into, understand in order to go to the next level in my business was move from outside in to inside out. I'll translate a little bit um, about what that means. Uh, my business going into there was a funnel. I think I, if I remember correctly, the way that I described it when he said, all right, so tell me a little bit about your business. Uh, I started with how I acquire customers. Okay. So the business was top to bottom, like a funnel, create content. They come into this machine. They come out as, you know, clients, basically. Um, it was very, very, very funnily for lack of a better term. Um, and Blake told me that my education business is not in education business. Okay. Um, it is a place where I finally found my voice and there's a lot behind that. Um, my writing on social media helped me lean into that. But, um, the way that the business was structured at this time was an artifact of that process. Okay. So going from outside in to inside out looks like this. Okay. Outside in was living on this content hamster wheel, attracting new clients, always feeding the machine, always launching at this low price point, all this stuff and this fixed fulfillment. And yeah, as a result, it, I was going too fast in one direction and the business was kind of just staying the same. Um, the alternative is building a business from the inside out where I am as close to the work as possible and kind of, you know, Blake said the word obsessed with this new fulfillment mechanism. And then everything that you do comes directly from there. So you're really flying close to the sun. And for me, he was like, that means you, sir, need an actual core offer. 
the current business that you have, the current offer is a lead magnet. It's a $2,000 lead magnet, but for you, there needs to be an actual core offer with some depth. And the charge the most money for the least amount of work version of that was something like group calls only for eight to 12K. And yeah, your current offer is a lead magnet, sell it for 3K, do a 30 day sprint, and it just leads people in to your core offer. All right, so those are the four things I need to accept. For the last 12 years, fear's been fuel. Time to drop that fuel and pick up a new one. Number two, your agency in your life is your down payment for your info education business. This is your new fuel. Three, shut down your agency. And four, move from outside in to inside out. So in terms of action items, I'm gonna consolidate two of them. And yeah, it looked a little bit like this. So there's three things that need to happen that took place over the next seven months. This is October 31st that I had this call. Uh, yeah, sunk in in waves. Some of it, like the implementation and an awareness was like this. Other things I really needed to marinate on. So there are three things. Get the new fuel, shut down the agency, and sell an actual core offer that makes sense for you. All right, let's start with the new fuel. This is the, the most important thing by far, okay? So I'll scroll down here. The one thing that at the time that I was doing this onboarding call with Blake, no one publicly knew about me is that I have been in long-term recovery from addiction for almost 13 years. Um, I'm active in a recovery community that helps people to get and stay clean. It is literally the foundation for everything that I do in my life. And the entire time, um, it has been completely separated, siloed off from my business. And I'll talk more about that in a second, but it is like the operating system behind everything that I do. All the closest people in my life are in recovery or know that I'm in recovery, but it's something that I have not spoken about publicly up until that point because I didn't want to, and this is what I told myself, um, I didn't want to like monetize, quote unquote, something that was like so special to me, so core to my identity. Um, obviously, there's a whole lot more to that that I've unraveled. Um, but what I told myself was like, oh, let me tell you this story about myself. And oh, by the way, buy my $49 course <laughs> or something like that. That's how that's how it felt to me. Um, but at my core, this is like the most important thing in my life by far. Um, it's something that I do every day that I'm involved with every day. And yeah, it's like the foundation behind everything that I do. So the problem was this became abundantly clear over the last nine months or six months or whatever. Um, I was throttling myself in such an insane way. And, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that looked like. Maybe, um, I'll, I'll draw something. Um, okay. Does this thing work? Nope. So how to work less this idea. Um, the idea of the lifestyle business was something that I leaned into, um, because it allowed me to kind of keep up this separation of church and state for, for a better term. So while I was running my agency, okay, I'll just draw this. Um, so this is time up here. Okay. Arrow, arrow. This is my time. That's what we're talking about. Over here is my business. Okay. Biz. And the purpose of this business previously that my agency, 500K a year, you know, 10 hours a week. The purpose of it was to make as much money as possible, all right, in as little time as possible, clock, okay? So that, so that I could exit the business and then come over here and do this, all right? Yeah, and then what's over here? This is what I called my life, all right? And over here, I had hobbies, uh, my recovery, exercise, my family, meditation, reading, travel, um, music, like everything 
that I thought was completely separate and siloed off from the business. I just focused on my business as the business is this thing over here that fuels my life. It is just this little machine that I built that lets me do whatever the hell I want, <laughs> whenever I want. That was the thought process. And as a result, like this is the firewall. This is the big, big barrier between business and life. And yeah, this type of approach works until it doesn't. And then you're sitting having <laughs> Blake tell you that you built a business based on fear because that's literally what was going on. So here's the reframe and here's the, the, the refresh and the, like the, the move on this. And we'll draw this out again. All right. Here's the biz. Here's the life. If any of you have been hanging out in incubator and partners long enough, um, this will come as no surprise to you, but it was the biggest area that I needed to work on, which was work life integration. And this idea that there is no such thing as work in life and that there is this beautiful permeable barrier between business and life that they're really all the same thing. And everything that you do in life, it feeds the business, right? It powers what you do and the business you know, feeds the life at the same time. And for me, what I learned was from working with Blake is like my superpower, for lack of a better term, is this experience I have, this this experience of, of addiction and recovery and my story and what I went through and how I've helped people and how other people have helped me. And this is like the biggest chunk. This is everything over here. And when the firewall's up, Holy shit. <laughs> there is there is um there's no access. There's no access to this. You know, it's blocked completely. Um so as soon as I realized that like the barrier must not exist. There must be flow between business and life. Um everything made a lot more sense. And it's not it's not a violent move at all actually. Uh, I, you can still have a, a business that optimizes for making the most money and doing the least amount of work, right? That's just leverage. Um, but the way that I had approached it with this like focused lifestyle business, the only thing the lifestyle biz does is feed my life was creating this like really kind of fear-based situation. Um, so leaning into this right here and life feeding business and business feeding life was the secret for me. And allowing what is really my superpower to to feed the business um, and and to share that value there um, because it was being tremendously tremendously throttled as a result of how I've been doing it. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right, so we're back here. Yeah, I was unable to see for a long ass time um, the massive massive value in letting my recovery fuel my business. And for sure, like there is a stigma associated with, with recovery and speaking about it and telling your story publicly, um, you know, especially in like anonymous, like a lot of recovery communities are quote unquote anonymous. Um, so there was some stigma around that. Um, but what had happened is I just siloed out my business. So it was just a small sliver of my life. Um, so that I could go and just live my life outside of that. But yeah, by opening up the barrier, I let my life feed my business and my business feed my life. And the beauty of this is it lets my recovery fuel my business. And the crazy thing is my recovery and business journey have been running parallel this entire time. Okay, so I've been gaining immense, immense strength, wisdom, insight from my biz, and for my recovery. And yeah, they've just been like two ships passing in the night or two trains running and never the two shall meet. This is how it's been for, for the longest time. And separately, they are not leveraged, right? They do not fuel each other. There's just a cap to them running parallel. And they really, really, really needed to be combined. The insight that I gained, and I'm giving you the Cliff's Notes version. Um, this is not something that like just hit me like this, and I was like, okay, good, got it, check, moving on. 
Um, you'll notice that the day that I completed this new fuel thing was May 24th, 2024. All right, so that was literally like 10 days ago. <laughs> I had been working through the process, but like the final decision, the line in the sand that like this is it on the new fuel is really, really recent, right? It was like two weeks ago. So over the course of this process, one of the things that was really helpful in, in me making this decision and committing to it was getting to the core of my value. And Blake described this as how much you can charge for an interaction with you. Um, I'm sure there's other ways to define it as well. And uh, for me, it was conversations that I had with a lot of the folks in partners, um, other people on the same journey as me that clued me in and made it extremely, extremely obvious because I started opening up to some of them about what my thing was. And yeah, the, the message was so, so clear. Um, the true value is your recovery. Um, and the sizzle, for lack of a better term, is this you know 500K design agency or all this stuff, right? But everything at the core is just about the recovery. And the more that I gained awareness about this, um, I gained conviction about it. And it was kind of like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe like Super Mario, like <laughs> eating a mushroom or whatever, and just like leveling up, like doubling in size. Yeah, when I started to have this strong, strong conviction that this was the core of the value, a lot of things made sense. And, you know, just to speak more broadly, this applies to everyone, right? Anyone who's an expert, anyone who's really good at what they do, anyone who has a life's practice, um, there's a deeper reason why you are good at whatever you're good at. And for the longest time for me, I thought, oh, well, the value is that I built this, this business, it made a bunch of money, super leveraged, fed my lifestyle to let me do whatever the hell I wanted, you know, like pursue hobbies, like have a great life. And um, I thought that that was the reason. The reason was that I built this agency. Um, but it turns out that the deeper reason is this foundation of recovery and that the value is me and not this thing that I did or this thing that I created. And that's been the core for me. Uh, along this process, it's definitely been a journey of slowing down to speed up. Um, as I've been working with my clients and sharing more openly and honestly about this, um, a lot of just like really pr powerful insights uh, have emerged. For instance, just kind of randomly, I was talking about like how I was picking up this Morning Pages book um, called The Artist's Way. You're probably familiar with it. And I, I challenged my clients to do 30 days of Morning Pages. And <laughs> the hilarious thing was, I got probably more out of it than they did. Hopefully they got some stuff out of it too. But um, within a couple of days of doing my morning pages, the, this emerged front and center, which was that um, I needed to hop back into therapy and get involved with therapy, something that I really hadn't done since extremely, extremely early recovery. Um, so I've been digging into internal family systems therapy, um, doing EMDR therapy to like work through some traumatic events that have happened in my life, uh, neurofeedback, biofeedback, all the stuff have been part of the journey of just like doubling down on this new fuel. And all the stuff has been like building all this tremendous momentum, the journaling, the working less, spending time outside, reconnecting with my why, letting the recovery fuel my business. So in terms of like action steps, the thing that I've really, really needed to do is to start opening up and, and sharing my story. And one of the most important things that happened was I shared my story outside of my personal network. So on February 13th, I started our like weekly call with my clients and I just shared my story with them. I you know, let them know, listen, I've been in recovery for 13 years or almost 13 years. It's the most important part of my life. I basically ruined my entire life. Um, from, from addiction, I should be dead. Um, I have a lot of conviction around that as well. It's a miracle that I'm even here. And yeah, everything that, that I've done in business is a result of, is a result of this foundation. And the beautiful thing was 
they embraced it wholeheartedly. No one threw, no one threw tomatoes at me. Um, and it instantaneously increased the quality of our engagement right then and there. Um, the conversations are much more open. There is a willingness to go deeper with the clients and unbeknownst to myself, I was kind of operating with them on a surface level and see if you can like catch the parallel here because I was unwilling to go deep on what was really going on with me. I was not giving my clients permission to go deep on what's really going on with them. And as a result, I I could not help them as effectively as I could, because I think we're all pretty clear that (laughs) nine times out of 10, your business problem isn't actually a business problem. It's a you problem that manifests in your business. At least that's my observation. And yeah, if I wasn't willing to be open and honest about like what's really going on with me and I had this firewall up, uh, it really limited the engagement with my clients. So sharing that story was crucial, 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 crucial. Um, probably this week, maybe the early next week, um, I'm going to be taking this one step way further for me and um, sharing this publicly and basically like, coming out for lack of a better term, um, about my, my story, um, as a recovering addict. And that'll be the next step. And I, I sense that this is going to be the momentum that leads me into the next part of this journey. Um, but I'm not going to talk in this video about where I'm headed next. Cause I think that's probably, uh, another video in and of itself. So sharing my story was crucial. I've gotten so much encouragement from, from Blake, from all the folks and partners, um, to go out and do this. And every time I do it, it just gives me so much more conviction, um, about where the value is and how I can most help people by using this recovery as a fuel to do what I do. And then part two, this is something that like is very, very fresh for me. And it goes back to this idea of making the decision, right? The decision, the Latin is to cut, Um, it's not just like, oh, I'm thinking about it. I'm in pre-contemplation. It's the day where you decide from this point forward, this is how I'm living my life. And that decision just happened for me recently. Um, this was a decision to lean into that new fuel and recommit to my recovery as the fuel for what I do, share openly and honestly with other people, let go of the fear as fuel. And, uh, what a tremendous, uh, gift to let go of this fear. When I made that decision and I really, really committed to it, um, I felt like I just upgraded my batteries. <laughs> That's why the icon's a battery for this section. Um, and it was just so much extra energy because I was upgrading to a much bigger mission and fuel. And the way I described it to Blake is like this new fuel for me is like a big, big, big lever under the leverage that I already have in my business of marketing, of fulfillment, of sales, right? It's like the big ass lever that cranks the entire mini <laughs> lever that is the business. And yeah, just leaning into this power has been super, super, super important for me. Um, yeah, one of the, one of the most important things ever. So that's been the journey for me. It's still really, really fresh. You can see New Fuel was a week and a half ago that the decision was locked in, but this process has been going on for months, right? Um, thinking about it, like understanding my value, sharing it with other people one-on-one sharing it in the context of my group and really just feeling like, Oh, okay, this is, this is the path forward. And this is going to be the leverage and the foundation under everything that happens for my business from this point on. And this was the thing that when I made this decision, I felt like, okay, it's time to make this video and it's time to share it and move on to the next part of the journey. Um, So very, very, very important for me. Um, Yeah, this alone, this is, this is the big thing. Okay. So let's talk about shutting down my agency and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about my offer. And yeah, at the end of the video, don't worry. I'm going <laughs> to, what's the word? I'm going to open the kimono on the offer, marketing, the funnel, all that fun stuff. Um, so if you enjoyed my therapy session, you'll love my funnel. <laughs> okay. So shut down your agency. A lot of people come in 
whether it's to partners or to incubator with some version of a done for you business done for you offer. Um, obviously there's a lot of pain around that. I can tell you for me personally, after doing it for a decade, I was ready to not be in client services and creative client services, even though it was super, super, super leveraged. Um, my time had, had come on that part of the journey. And that was like the down payment for the next part of the journey. Okay. So Blake said, what do you say? Shut down your agency, right? So we covered these two already. We got, we got rid of the, the old fuel. We dropped it and we got the new fuel. Now it's time to shut down your agency. Okay. This decision actually happened on the onboarding call. I committed to this while I was sitting there with Blake. I was like, boom, we're in. And the reason for that is I was already in pre-contemplation about this prior to meeting Blake. Um, after a decade of working really closely with clients, being like enmeshed in their teams on a bunch of awesome creative projects, it was very clear to me that that journey was was coming to a close for me. Um, and the start of the info business and you know beginning to share my insights about that journey was that process already starting. So I was in the middle of it, but... As, as you know, Blake is a, a one-chop kill kind of guy. Um, and yeah, I, I probably could have um, danced along with with like, you know, keeping just a little bit of the agency running, just a tiny bit running um, for, for a while, you know, because there was money to be made there. Um, but I was already actively phasing out some clients as the info business scaled up. So um, like this idea of like faders and music, um, I was fading down as the, well, here it is, as the info business started making money, I was fading down the client services and kind of letting clients go and firing them um, as things switched. But this was a much better approach, okay? So the reason that this is so important, and I really want to speak to now anyone who is at that crossroads of like, I know I need to shut down this non-leveraged version of my info business, um, sorry, of my agency business, of my done for you thing, uh, this will speak directly to you. So idea space is this idea. <laughs> space is one of the most valuable things that we have as entrepreneurs. And I don't know what your situation is, but I can tell you that for me, most people would not shut down a business making half a million dollars a year in only five to 10 hours a week because that sounds really good, okay? But there is a massive, massive mental tax associated with keeping one of these things running. Five to 10 hours of work, yes. How many hours of thinking about the business? Okay, so despite the fact that it was optimized, it took five to 10 hours of my best mental energy each week. Okay, and that was fulfillment time. That was on meetings with clients, doing high level strategy. Like my five to 10 best hours of work a week were devoted to the agency and to making my clients happy. And the only way to get something super, super leveraged like that is the time that you work in there needs to be hot fire, right? It needs to be your best stuff. I was not doing five to 10 hours of emails. It was like leverage, really important, strategic, deep thinking, deep work, managing client relationships, sales, managing the team, all that stuff. Okay. So that five to 10 hours were my best five to 10 hours of thinking every week without a doubt. Okay. And when I was finally willing to let go of that, I cannot tell you. And when I, this was just when I made the decision, I had not even gotten rid of all the clients. It was like a ton of space and my brain's hard drive cleared when I let go of that. And this time is super, super important because it can be applied to a vehicle with a ton more leverage. And that's what I was realizing was, even though the design business was great, it was keeping me from doing the things that I really needed to do that were gonna really move the needle. So logistically, this was a process where I would talk about like, blending faders of income sources. But I made the decision on the onboarding call on October 31st 
that I was starting the process that day to get out with every client. The one that lasted the longest, their contract was a yearly retainer, um, 60 grand a year. And the contract ended on March 1st. So I hung on to that and I just let that retainer end at that point. Um, but I started proactively handing off clients to trusted freelancers. I had designers and people that I worked with for a long time who knew my clients. And I was like, here you go, just take it on. This is your client now. Uh, I let some contracts expire instead of renew. And I just slowly kind of extricated myself from that part of the business. And if you're going through this right now, or you're in pre-contemplation about it, or you know you should do it, or you're thinking about it, here's what I would recommend, okay? Um, one, <laughs> get out as fast as you can. Seriously, I cannot overstate how important idea space is. Mental space, mental clarity. You think it's only a little bit of time, but there is a huge difference between 1% and zero, okay? If we just 1% of your time focused on something, massive, massive difference between 1% and zero. And I saw that. So yeah, freeing up that idea space allowed me to do all the things that I did from that point on. If you're managing cash flow and you're worried about it, you can think about it like blending faders of income sources, you know, like launch something, start selling it, taper things down. Um, but the other thing that I would recommend is get some clarity on your runway and your burn rate. You might realize that you actually have a tremendous amount of runway and a tremendous amount uh, of, or a tremendously low burn rate. Uh, which means that you can get out sooner than you realize. So if you don't know what your runway is, which is basically how much time you have until you're broke, um, and you don't know how much money you're spending, what your burn rate is, figure that stuff out. You may be able to just cut it off completely and just lean into the faith that you will be able to supplement your income, that with all of this freed up mental energy and this freed up focus, it's going to be very, very easy to step into this new kind of part of your journey and build something with a ton more leverage that is much more aligned to what you're really trying to do. So yeah, get out of the agency. <laughs> if you've been sitting on it for a while, I can tell you one of the best things that I've done was, was getting out. So for me, the official date was March 1st. The decision was made on the onboarding call. All right. So we've got the new fuel, agency's closed. Let's talk about selling a core offer that is a real high ticket offer. One of the things that I've learned, sorry for the scrolling, and that I found incredibly strange about this process was as I went through it over the last seven months, I found myself having to relearn a lot of lessons that I had learned down pat in my design agency. Okay, I knew how to charge a ton, a ton of money. I knew how to hop on sales calls and say big numbers without flinching. And yet there I was with my info business selling a course for two grand. Okay, when people, my minimum rate at my design agency was $60,000. I would not get on the phone with someone unless they had at least $60,000 to spend. And yet on the other side, I was selling this course for two grand. It made no sense. And that's why this core offer thing was so important for me because it was just like relearning this lesson that I had already learned and leaning into it. And um, yeah, I think you'll find on your journey that sometimes there is this practice of relearning that needs to happen, even though there are things that we know down pat when applied to, you know, if you had a previous business or if you were doing like done for you or whatever. Um, yeah, you have to apply it to, to your info business as well. Okay, so launching a new offer. Blake's assignment was really clear. Get a real offer, brother, okay? <laughs> and the goal with this is to work closely with my best clients, fly close to the sun, and get out of this trap of being the professor, for lack of a better term, where I just show up and I talk about the same eight lessons, go through all the same slides, and I'm just like teaching live the same stuff. Whereas like my value is just skyrocketing, it's increasing, I'm continuing to grow, and the original course was just, it's staying the same, okay? And the course is great, don't get me wrong, um, but, 
for me to sit there and be the guy who reads the slides was not what I needed to be doing. I needed to be working with people where I could share what I'm thinking about, how I'm approaching my business, work very closely with them, and we could be on the same journey, right? So there wasn't this chasm between Rich in 2021 or whatever, building this leveraged design agency and locking it all in, and then me in 2024, where I've, I've been growing for the last three years. Okay, so what does it look like to actually get one of these offers off the ground? And I want to get a little bit more tactical and practical in this section because I believe how I approached this served me really, really well. And maybe this will save you some pain also. Okay. So I wanted to sell an actual, oops, I wanted to sell an actual core offer. So that is something that is eight grand, eight to 10 grand was where Blake said to start with, just to start with and work close with my best clients and fly close to the sun. You can see that this is, an extremely, extremely non-specific goal. <laughs> it does not say a promise about, you know, we're going to do this and this and this. And like, you know, with my eight step module program and, you know, follow my patented fr proprietary framework and then you'll do YZ and become this. Okay. The stated goal, which I took to the market was work closer with my best clients, all right? And I've been using this in my brain, and I've, as I've been talking to some other people in Incubator and in partners, I call it this thing a minimum viable offer. And at this stage in your business, when you're recalibrating and trying to understand, like, what's my real value here? How can I charge the most amount of money for the least amount of work? The solution is the minimum viable offer, okay? And what I mean by that is, as little stuff as possible, right? The old instinct, at least for me, was how do you create more value? How do you provide more value? You just give people more shit until they're sitting in a pile of shit where they don't know what's useful and what's valuable. And they think, well, I have all this stuff and therefore it must be valuable because there's a lot of it. All right, the opposite and the minimum viable offer is what can I do to charge the most amount of money for the least amount of work? Okay. Like talks about this all the time. And there's actually a really important reason for approaching an offer this way. It's that you don't actually know what people need and don't need right now. And that's a good thing. I'll share a bit about my experience in a second with why this is so important. But I know for me personally, if I had tried to predict what was going to come from my engagement with my clients. If I had tried to stamp on it, put a name on it, productize it, lock it in, say, these are the insights that you're going to learn, I would have been selling myself so short. You know, if you had asked me to write down 50 of the things that I thought were going to happen, it would have been not even close, okay? I did not know what people needed and didn't need. I didn't know what the engagement was going to look like. And to try to over-engineer an offer it's a huge mistake this early in the game. So for me, I'll give you an example of what this looked like for me. I was leaning into how can I sell something with as little adornment as possible? And I made up this name, which I called The Lab. And the reason I called it was because I didn't want to have a real name. I didn't want to have a brand. I didn't want to stamp anything on it. Um, this was just going to be a space where if you want to work closely with me, you can. Okay, I'll show you what the offer looked like. Where is it? All right, this is the offer. This is one page Google Doc, literally just a piece of paper. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire thing, um, but the way that people received it, and if you're curious, and I'll, I'll link to all these as well, um, was they received a Loom video. And this was essentially just me t talking through the Loom video saying, this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, I want to be very transparent. This is not a course. This is mentorship with me. This is working very closely with me. Other than that, I don't know what it's going to look like, and we're going to figure it out together. Um, you know, people could sign up this website. There was no, no landing page. Whoops. There was no landing page. Um, there was... If you went to this, you would just go to a Stripe 
checkout page, workhouselive.com. Um, and then you could just book a call. That was the only thing. There was no marketing materials at all. The only thing was this video and this offer thing. And yeah, the minimum viable offer was like, yeah, we're going to do this. Simplify your business, increase profits, decrease hours, create leverage, enjoy the journey. And then I described a little bit, maybe, of what this might look like, but I'm not, maybe. Um, and yeah, I was like, okay, um, first group, 20 spots, it's eight grand, 12 months working with me. There's going to be one call and it's not a course. There's no course stuff. And yeah, we'll just, we'll just get on the call and we'll work together. And that was, this was the minimum viable offer. Okay. And you know, just the minimum of what needed to happen here to find the right people and to get them jumping. All right. Um, same idea with articulation and messaging. I wanted to have in that offer, in that little doc, as little messaging as humanly possible to convert. My experience has been that there is, you just don't know. I didn't know anything about what this engagement was going to be. So why would I back myself into a corner trying to engineer articulation when there was not time, there was no time for it to be created, okay? Um, sorry, I missed this part. Yeah, in terms of fulfillment, it was just school community. Clients bought one call a week. That's all they were promised is one call a week. We do two, but they only paid for one. No content. There's no course material. There's nothing like that. Um, the first group of people started at eight grand. The second group of people, I raised it to 12. Now it's at 18. Okay. So I've raised the price every single time. There's a reason for that. We'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so we have a minimum viable offer, which is this thing called the lab. Um, we have a document that explains what it is, a little bit of articulation. Uh, so who's this going to? Okay, my opinion is that the best way to approach your first offer, right? You're um, entering into your true value phase, which is what we, what we talk about, is to go direct. Um, you do not want to start a podcast to sell <laughs> your minimum viable offer, okay? You do not want to have a long, drawn-out play. You don't want to start a YouTube channel from scratch and say, this is how I'm going to get leads, right? Those are all things that take time. Like, they benefit from compounding. It's like the stock market. Um, you need people in the program. I need people in the program ASAP so that I can start working with them so I can figure out what the hell's going on. And... What I've observed is that there's a lot of um, energy towards indirect means of finding leads at this, like in this true value phase when you're selling like your first core offer, your first real offer. Um, my suggestion is to be as direct as possible. Okay. So whether that means DMing people that you know or people that your friends' friends know, um, sending emails to people that you know directly, hopping on sales calls sending it out to your list if you already have a, a list, directly messaging people who follow you on social media or in your community. Like you should really be trying to exhaust every person who you can touch with an email or a DM or a call before you consider any of these long-term things. And what you'll probably find is that's gonna book you a bunch of calls and then you'll realize that you actually just suck at sales calls <laughs> and that's why you're not closing people. But we'll talk about that later, okay? So- for me, yeah, this couldn't. This is the most direct, unleveraged thing that I've done. Um, I have about 300 past clients with my regular course, and I was just going to start with them because I knew, okay, you've taken my course, you paid me money already, um, we have a good relationship, you got a ton of value out of this first thing that I've done. Um, there are going to be people in there that want to work closer with me. So that's how I started. And, uh, I actually sat down with my course manager and we took every single person who had ever taken my program and we sorted them by three categories. And that's how I kind of figured out the phases for people to get pitched for this. And they all got direct emails from me manually done. Okay. This is all done manually, no automation, no AI, no assistant. And I was looking for people to meet three categories, okay? So there was the money fit, 
um, there was the active fit and there was the vibe check. So what that means is, first of all, for the first people into the engagement, I wanted to make sure that they were a money fit. And at that point, it was making 100 grand a year um, to work with me. Second thing was active. Okay, there were people that met this requirement, but they were kind of lurkers in my course. I knew that the culture of the lab was going to be really important up front. So I wanted to have people in that I could interface with who weren't just going to like lurk and ghost and like, you know, show up for a call and then disappear for a while. Um, Because I knew the culture was going to be really important. So they needed to be active in my old course, How to Work Less. Okay. And then the last one was my blanket veto vibe check. (laughs) Do I want to spend a year with you? Do I want to look at you on a phone call? every day for an entire year. And for the first phase, I had 60 clients who met all three categories of the 300. They were a money fit, they were an active fit, and they passed the vibe check. And all I did was send them three emails, and I'll tell you what those emails said. Okay? Um, And I'll I'll link to all these docs, too, if you want to, like, see them. Um, The point with all this stuff is not so you can copy it right? It's to extract the principles from it. If you want to copy it, by all means, my suggestion would be whatever you can come up with that pertains to your business is going to be way better than what I came up with that pertains to my business. But I think examples are helpful. So I sent three emails. That's it. Three emails got me 20 people. What's the math here? Three emails got me, where is it? 19 people in made me $152,000 in about a week. Okay. Three emails going direct. Okay. Um, first email, personal invite for X. I sent every one of these by hand. Hey person, this is rich. Really? No assistant, no automation, no AI. I'm sending out this invite to just 63 people all hand selected for my new program, work less lab. If you're reading this, I'm positive. You'd be a great fit. This is a rare opportunity to work closely with me. I'm looking for an initial group to start working with as soon as this week. Here's the loom video. It shares my vision, how it works, shows you how to sign up. If you have any questions, book a call. I've opened up my calendar. Check it out. Let's talk soon. That's the email. Boom. Okay. I sent up a follow-up. Um, maybe at this point, like, I don't know, 10 or something spots were taken. Sent it to everyone. Just a heads up, 10 out of 20 spots are taken. If you're interested, I'd love to chat, book a call. Um, if you want to just sign up, you can sign up here. If you're not interested, let me know and I'll leave you alone. Final email. This is towards the end of the period. Last email I'm going to send. We have, I don't know, a couple spots left. Lab starts next week. Grab a slot if you're interested. Have a great week. That was it. Okay. Three emails sent personally from my personal email to 63 people equaled 19 clients in the program, amazing people, and about 150 grand, okay, by going direct. Minimum viable offer, minimum viable articulation, minimum viable leads. All right, so the results, um, I did the first phase, 19 people at 8K. Second phase, I launched to um, more people from my client list. I sent it out to 78 more. Um, 13 people signed up at 12K, made 156K. Um, The price now is 18 grand, okay? It's gonna keep going up, probably 24 to 30 soon. The reason that (laughs) I increased the price, right, if you're just curious, The first round, I want to say I booked like maybe I had 21 sales calls or something and 19 people closed. Okay. What that means, if you haven't extrapolated this out, is that means the price is way too cheap. Okay. If you have 19 people (laughs) close, uh, if you have like a 90% closing rate, yeah, you need to increase your prices immediately. Okay. And a similar thing happened here, um, which told me I am still nowhere near the value ceiling for this, this group, but I had to set the price somewhere and who knows, you know, I could have sent it at 8k and only closed 10%. And then that would have been a very good signal to me about like where the value currently lies and where people are seeing the value. Um, all right. So last thing I want to talk about 
um, is just some lessons and insights that maybe you can take from this. Um, as I went through this process of creating an actual core offer, which leans into my true value, which is just who I am as a person, right? All my experience in recovery, in business, working closely with people, direct mentorship, working together in a group, flying close to the sun, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, I can tell you that this has been some of the most tremendously rewarding and exciting stuff that I've done in my career, being able to work with people this closely. I've learned so much about business, about myself, about people, about my clients, about how to help people, about how to be of service. And if I had never done this minimum viable offer, minimum viable articulation, it wouldn't have happened, right? I would have over-engineered this thing that I thought people wanted. All right. Um, so this is my one preaching moment. <laughs> For those of you who are in incubator or in partners, and you are at this point in your journey which I'm calling, no one's coined this term, but it's the term that I use in my head, what I call the pre-true value phase, okay? So I believe that the true value phase, which is this place where you finally go out and you start working with clients in a new paid engagement where you're charging the most amount of money for the least amount of work, getting paid for your true value, for your insights. I believe that that phase does not start until clients are paying you, okay? And you are in the pre-true value phase if you're doing all of this stuff on, around, adjacent, before it, right? Like finding um, finding your way, um, like creating free groups, doing free stuff, all, all the stuff that is like pre-true value phase, okay? And the key insight here and why I'm talking about this is... All the work that really needs to be done in incubator, in partners to build an incredible, incredible business happens once you enter the true value phase. Everything that you need for your business will come from working with your clients who pay you money because they value what you do. Okay. Notice I didn't say everything you need will come from working with people for free <laughs> in a free group. Okay, that's a start, but that's not where you're going to get the true insights. There is a massive chain. There's a big difference in the exchange of energy when people pay for us, right? They're acknowledging our value and they're committing to themselves and they're committing to us. Everything that you need to build a business that can make seven figures, eight figures will come directly from working with your clients. Okay, how you talk about the engagement, the articulation, how you message, how you approach sales, what's your product, your confidence, your conviction in yourself, your value. All of these things, in my experience, have been revealed to me by working directly with my clients, flying close to the sun, going deeper with them in their business. Um, I could never have predicted any of these things if I were to have just made it up in the pre-true value phase. Okay, so I want to encourage you, if you've been there for a while, to start thinking about what it would look like to enter into the true value page phase as soon as possible, okay? So that means like minimum viable offer, minimum viable articulation, minimum viable leads, like get it done. Um, start getting paid, please do yourself a favor and start getting paid. Um, what I've observed, and this isn't a blanket statement, but what I've observed is there are two pain points where I see people not go into the true value phase and they stay in pre-true value phase, okay? Number one is they do not wanna reach out to people directly, okay? They want to do marketing via indirect means, okay, right? Like I'm starting a podcast or um, I'm starting a YouTube channel or you know I'm gonna create this like long complicated funnel thing um, and then people will eventually get in or like, I'm going to start a free group from scratch. All these things are indirect. And most of you, if you're an expert, probably actually know a lot of people who you could help, who you could work closely with right now. Okay. This isn't a blanket statement. It's just what I've observed. And the pain point is that you don't want to be direct. 
You do not want to just literally say, I'm doing it. I'm sending a DM. I'm sending an email. I'm calling someone up, right? I am going to look stupid and put myself out there and literally ask someone (laughs) for money and to work together, okay? And I will probably get rejected and it's gonna be painful. But what's on the other side is you get to do this and it's amazing, okay? Um, That's pain point number one that I observed. Number two is if you get to that point, it's doing sales calls, right? Um, You think, okay, charge the most, most, charge the most amount of money for the least amount of work. You have that in place. You've got a high price. You have great fulfillment. You have a ton of leverage. And then you get on a couple sales calls and you realize, oh, no one's saying less. No, sorry. No one's saying yes. Therefore, it must be a problem with my price or I'm not providing enough value. There's not enough stuff here. When in reality, you just haven't done sales calls before, or you're just not good at them yet, okay? It is an acquired skill. There are a ton, ton of resources um, to get better at sales calls. But in my estimation, these are the two main business roadblocks. I'm not gonna touch on like personal roadblocks because those are there too. Business roadblocks is getting comfortable doing sales calls and getting comfortable being direct with people. That is the price that you must pay to enter the true value phase and get everything that you probably ever wanted out of your business, all right? Once you do the true value phase, I believe this is when the real work actually starts. At least it was for me. Uh, After working with my clients for over six months now, yeah, I know know so much about myself. I know so much about them. I know how to help people at a much deeper level. I'm really clear on my value. And um, if I needed to now go to the market and articulate and sell and productize or whatever, like I have the insights that needed to emerge in order to make that happen. Okay, last note, which I didn't really know where to put it and then some parting wisdom and I'll end this because this has been over an hour. Content pause. I'm a dude with 400,000 followers across a bunch of social media platforms. Once I committed to this offer, okay, I launched this thing on November 28th, I had a really, really important realization. For this season in my business, I no longer needed to create content. This is someone who is on the content hamster wheel so, 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 so hard, okay? I stopped doing Instagram posts. I stopped sending out weekly emails. I stopped creating content, all right? And the beauty of this was... I had this idea in my head that I needed to keep creating content, right? To keep the hamster wheel rolling. Um, But when I sat down and I was actually talking through like what's happening in the engagement um, for this season of my business, for, for the, you know, seven month true value phase period, all of my clients came from my current client list. They came from people that I know already that I have a relationship with. And instead of being like, well, let's keep the content hamster real rolling, I was like, my time is best spent leaning in and going deeper with the people that I'm working with. If you want to hear me talk about this in real time, if you watch one of the San Diego things, um, yeah, I talk about it. I talk about my relationship with with content and social media. And uh, this was a big insight from that. And yeah, this just fits in with this idea of minimum viable messaging, minimum viable articulation. Um, I didn't need to go out and post a million things and send a million emails and do all this marketing stuff um, because there was so much leverage and I had this offer that was much more aligned with me. Okay. Ba-da-da. Parting wisdom. I will leave you with this. Well, actually, let me just summarize this real quick. So here's a piece of paper that Blake sent me a picture of after we did five hours of onboarding. This is on October 31st. This dude basically like didn't know me very well, Um, but he was able to extract all of this stuff in five hours of of a deep dive into my life and business. Um, It took me seven months to complete everything on here. It was a combination of just things that needed to get done, things that I needed to come to terms with, things that I needed to open up about, 
things that I, the, the person, like me becoming a new person, basically. And uh, yeah, this is like, th this time feels like this is closing the book on that, that onboarding and that, that part of the journey and that part of the true value phase and heading into, into a new phase, which I will speak about and I will share about, um, but it's not for this video <laughs> for sure. This is just setting the foundation for and teeing up the foundation for everything that, that I want to do next. Um, so yeah, new fuel, shut down your agency. How about an actual core offer <laughs> that's expensive? All that is done. Okay. I'll leave you with some parting wisdom. Um, you can take, if you don't agree with this, take what you like, leave the rest. I won't be offended to each their own. This has just been my experience. What's worked well for me. Number one, get into your true value phase ASAP. Everything that you need will come from working with your best clients who truly value what you do, leaning into your expertise, lying close to the sun while getting paid actual money, real US dollars or wherever you're from, Canadian dollars, Bitcoins, whatever it is, real money, real exchange of value between two people, okay? where both sides feel immense gratitude because they feel that what they're getting is worth even more than, you know, what they put up for it. Working with your clients for money in the true value phase is going to give you everything that you need in order to build a seven or eight figure business. Okay. It's going to give you the articulation, how to speak about your expertise. It's going to give you the messaging, how you talk about what you do. It's going to give you the sales. You're going to learn about sales skills. You're going to learn how to talk about your value and to help people to change. Um, it's going to teach you how to build an incredible product. You'll have confidence. You'll have conviction. And you'll finally understand your value. All right? Um, don't spend too long hanging out in the pre-true value phase. Um, that doesn't mean the pre-true value phase shouldn't exist. There's a lot to unlearn in the pre-true value phase that needs to happen. So you're going to be the best litmus test of where you, where you feel on this. And if you heard me talk about you should get into your true value phase as fast as possible and that maybe you felt something about that, that's probably a good sign that you know somewhere that it's time for you. All right. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about and you're hanging out in the pre-true value phase, relax, enjoy the journey, slow down to speed up. Okay. Um, when it's time... Minimum viable offer. Charge the most money for the least amount of work. Do not over-engineer the offer. Do not over-engineer the messaging. Do not over-engineer the leads. Go direct, okay? Um, create something that has as little stuff as possible, as little articulation as you need, as little messaging as possible to convert um, so that you have the freedom to explore. And go directly to the people that are around you, that are in your life, don't be afraid to get rejected, okay? Go direct. Okay. If you enter the true value phase, I believe that that is where the real work begins um, on this journey. What else? Don't be afraid to raise your prices, okay? If you are sitting on a price that you are comfortable with, I can promise you, you are not charging enough. And I'll go one step further, okay? Is not the price, okay? If people are saying no to you, you are probably just bad at selling. <laughs> That's okay. There's nothing wrong with being bad at selling. I can tell you that I was bad at selling for a very long time and I didn't even know it. So it's just part of the journey. But I've heard so many people say, oh, the price is too high. I can't close. Therefore, I must lower the price. Therefore, I need a lower ticket offer. I need something cheaper that I can get to these people. Okay, I've watched the sales calls 10 times out of 10. It is a sales calls issue. You have an incredible amount of resources on sales in here. Um, but if you are feeling friction around price, okay, and no one is saying yes to you, it's probably not the price. It's probably that you're bad at sales. Okay. Finally, do you feel like you need conviction for charging higher prices, this is really important too, okay? When you're in the charge the most for the least amount of work, 
get to the core of your value. For me, this was a process that required me opening up to other people, getting vulnerable with other people and allowing them to see things about me that I didn't see in myself. Okay, there's something very paradoxical about this value thing is that like we can't see it ourselves. It's very hard for us to see when it's so, so obvious in other people when we look at them. Okay, there is a deep, deep reason, many reasons probably, why you are an expert, why you're good at whatever you do. If you are unclear on your value and you need conviction, okay, there's some places you can talk. There's some people you can talk to. You have to ask them. You should talk to your clients, talk to your significant other. Your significant other probably knows if you have one. Um, ask your friends, ask the people in your network, right? People in incubator or partners or whatever. Um, and they'll tell you, okay? I've had um, a lot of generous people share with me the value that they see in me. And it's only hammered home my conviction in what I do and kind of how I'm able to help people and the prices that I charge. Okay. Um, yeah, you need, you need that, that conviction and you need to understand that value. Okay. At the end of the day, the value is you. It's not this thing that you did or this thing that you do. Everyone around here sees it except you. And the best thing that you can do is uncover why it is. All right. That's it. This has been my journey, seven months in college. I hope this was helpful. Um, I'll share all the stuff related to this. And uh, my hope is that you can use my journey and help your, your journey to be a little bit smoother. And maybe you won't make some of the mistakes that I did. And yeah, that's it. Signing off.